Tonight on Sports Pause, the men's basketball team headed back to Hamden after their strong performance in the Paradise Jam, and the women's team looked to stay undefeated. We'll see how they did. Also, men's hockey looked to stay on a roll, while women's hockey looked to reach double-digit wins on the season. All that and more coming up next on Sports Pause. Tonight, Sports Pause closes an era, and we're inviting you to the Going Away Party. Welcome, everyone. I'm John Alba. And I'm Mark Spillane. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we have an action-packed show that you will not want to miss. And it's all about the bank tonight, Mark. And while we're not looking for cash, per se, we are looking for highlights. And we've got them, John. Hockey, basketball, and a few feature pieces to top it all off. This is the final edition of Sports Pause this semester, and it starts right now. Tom Moore's men's basketball team returned to Hamden after a roller coaster week in the Virgin Islands Tuesday night. While the team faced the likes of Momo Jones, Shabazz Napier, and Sherrod Wright in Paradise Jam, its toughest challenge would come in Lehigh's C.J. McCollum at Lender Court. Would the Bobcats pull off an upset of Duke-sized proportions at the bank? Let's find out. C.J. McCollum, one of the top scorers in the nation, yeah, he was looking to do well in this one, and I'm going to give you a spoiler. He did all right, but first off, it is Zaid Hurst. He's made that one of his Taylor tools. The jump shot is good, putting QU up, but Anthony DeRazio follows it up for Lehigh. To the lane, not an easy layup. Both teams going at it back and forth. Here's Dave Johnson to Shaq Shannon. Tom Moore loves his three-point shooters. Yeah, Shannon is one of those, but here comes McCollum gliding past the Bobcats. The spin, and all the way back to for McCollum, but he was not done there. He's going to take the ball and drive out past the outstretched arms of Garvey Young. That's two for McCollum. And this one would get the students going crazy. Over to Ike Azatam with authority. The spirit group is loving it. A little monkey there going on. No harm, no foul, no pun intended. Durazio over to Gabe Nutson for a lay and That's two for Lehigh. 35-32 lead for them. Then Durazio, the three-point shot. 40-36 lead for Lehigh. Quinnipiac would not... Bat down though. Zaid Hurst for three. The Bobcats are fighting. They are going hard, but then here's McCollum. 30 points on the evening for him. And yeah, I told you, he's one of the best in the nation. Now, here's a problem for the Bobcats all night long missing free throws. Garvey Young had 10 for them. They'd miss 11 more on the evening. Zaid Hurst there misses it. The Bobcats would drop this one. The student section not happy about it. And they dropped to two and four on the season. Tom Moore and CJ McCollum had more after the game. Yeah, I just tried to assert myself and be more aggressive. You know, I said our team was lacking some score, lacking some energy, so I just tried to bring that to in the second half. Fuck, it just came at a bad time. It really came at a loud time. The crowd was, you know, I thought the crowd was uh, waiting maybe for a reason to get excited. So we come out of the first six, two and four. It could have been four and two, should have, would have, could have, whatever, but we're two and four. And um, um, now we got to raise our level and play four good teams again. One day after the men's team hosted Lehigh, the undefeated women's basketball squad traveled down the road to face the Yale Bulldogs. Let's see who won this rivalry game. Quinnipiac huddling up, getting ready to take on their rivals, the Yale Bulldogs. First, it's going to be the Bobcats grabbing some momentum. That's Abshire gets it down low to Guastella for the easy lay and Bobcats take the early lead. Abshire again, this time gets it to Felicia Barron for three, goes to the left a little, grab by Jasmine Martin. Nice vision, she kicks it out for Gus Guastella, who knocks down the three. Bobcats continue to build their lead. Yale's gonna try to make a bit of a comeback here, but it's gonna be stolen away by Felicia Barron. Swiper, no swiping, what else is new? Goes coast to coast for the tough lay-in, extending the Bobcats' lead. But the Bulldogs would respond, they're not gonna back down. Elysian's gonna come up to court, she's gonna make a nice long pass across to Megan Vasquez, who knocks down the three, Yale cutting into the Bobcats' lead. Quinnipiac not allowing them to come back too much, though. Jasmine Martin dribbles up, bounce pass to Abshire for the easy lay-in. Bobcats finish off the first half on a strong note. They're going to continue that momentum as they open up the second half, coming the other way. Cameron Warner gets it to Nikolai Ostergaard, who gets it back to Warner. Warner with a tough lay-in underneath, puts the Bobcats up 20 points on their rival Bulldogs, but Yale making a run. Vasquez dribbles up. She stops, makes a quick pass to Sarju, who nails the three-pointer. Yale kind of making a little bit of a run here, but the Bobcats are going to say, enough of that. 
The Bulldogs would try to make one more attempt here, and they're going to knock down a three. That's a nice pass outside to Halesian, who knocks it down. But Jasmine Martin was the key player on the day. The Jasmine Martin show, you might say, underneath. She's going to gather the loose ball, put up the jumper, and knock it down. Bobcats continuing to put the pressure on. Boo Abshire moving it up the court. Nice cross-court pass. Who else but Martin drills the three. Quinnipiac continues to build the lead. Yale attempting one last final attempt, but Boardman's long pass is taken away by Lisa Lieback. She takes it coast to coast for the layup and seals the deal for the Bobcats. Quinnipiac would hang on to defeat Yale by the final score of 89-62 and keep themselves undefeated with a 4-0 record. Coach Fabry's team defeated Rhode Island at home 76-60 last Saturday prior to the victory over Yale on Wednesday. Felicia Barron led the way with 17 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 steals. Following Wednesday's win, the Bobcats traveled to Brown for the Brown Bear Classic, where they defeated New Hampshire 60-53 yesterday and Ryder 72-57 this afternoon to win the Brown Classic. Sam Guastella's big day led Quinnipiac yesterday, while Jasmine Martin led the Bobcats in today's contest. The victories improved Quinnipiac's record to 6-0 on the season. They get back on the court this upcoming Saturday when they host Holy Cross. Two Quinnipiac basketball stars took home Northeast Conference Player of the Week honors to close out the month of November. Even after the 77-66 loss to Lehigh, guard Dave Johnson received the recognition after his performance in the Paradise Jam. Johnson averaged almost 14 points during the tournament and hit a game-tying three versus UConn as the clock expired in overtime. The NEC also gave the award to women's team guard Felicia Barron after her 17-point effort versus the University of Rhode Island. Barron is averaging nearly 18 and a half points for the undefeated Bobcat squad, along with just under four steals per game. She was one of the best in the nation last year, Mark. And, you know, when you get a pass, it's off the dribble. And when we need to discuss basketball, we bring in an analyst. And with that, Arthur Lane joins us to talk Quinnipiac basketball. Arthur, let's start off with the undefeated women's team. Frankly, why have they been so good? Well, John, I think that you have to look at Felicia Barron first and foremost, averaging 17.3 points a game uh, and also getting four steals has been huge. But this year, I think they have a lot more of a balanced attack. You look, we saw Sam Gostella have a huge game against Yale. Jasmine Martin's been playing all uh, well all year. So I think that they have a more balanced attack this year, which is why they're doing so well. They also force 23 turnovers a game. They only turn the ball over 14 times. That's a pretty good ratio to me. Well, Arthur, we're heading into the break and NEC play is right around the corner. Do you see this team struggling at all in their conference games? Quite frankly, I don't. I think that they could run through uh, the conference play undefeated. Um, you look at Sacred Heart as one of the other good teams in the conference. But I think that, like I said earlier, they've matured so much this year. Last year, they struggled in conference play towards the end. I think that this year, with another year under all these young players' belts, including uh, senior uh, Felicia Barron, I think they get it done handily this year. That's very true, Arthur. And, you know, one of the things that the men's team has struggled with last week was free throws. Is this their only concern right now? I think it might be a little bit bigger than just free throws. You look at a lot of missed layups, you look at some blown leads towards the end of the game. I think it's their focus. I think that you miss a lot of layups. You go 19 for 30 in free throws, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I, you know, you just shake your head as you leave some of these games. But uh, I think that they can get it together um, focus-wise, but they really just need to hone in as they start uh, getting ready for conference play. Lastly, Arthur, should the men's team be worried heading into the break, or was this little slide just a result of the travel early in the season? I don't think they should be worried, um, but if you go at the beginning of the year, if you say after six games that they're two and four, um, that was quite likely. Um, you know, we didn't expect them to beat Iona per se, and they also lost to an uh, American, which you expected them to win. So they're about where they should be, um, just wins and losses coming from different teams. But uh, I don't think they need to worry too much. We saw them play great against a UConn team, George Mason as well. Um, so I think that they'll get it, uh, get it together. I the five more uh, non-conference games before they hit the conference schedule, um, I think they'll be ready. Well, thanks, Arthur. We always appreciate it. But now it's time to break up the fast break. But when we come back, we have highlights of women's hockey and its busy weekend versus RPI and Union. Could the Bobcats pick up two important conference wins? But we won't stop there. The Red Hot men's team was in action on the road against the same schools. Find out what happened next on Sports Balls. 
Welcome back to Sports Pause, everyone. While all of us were here enjoying our respective weekends, the men's ice hockey team was busy with its recent routine of winning. First, the Bobcats knocked off 7th-ranked Union College on Friday night, 4 to nothing, behind another great performance by Jeremy Langlois. Then, they defeated RPI last night by the score of 3-1. to one. Matthew Pekka scored the shorthanded game-winning goal with just under 9 minutes to play. The two wins pushed their conference record to 6-0 and as they sit atop the ECAC standings and extend their streak without a loss to eight consecutive games dating back to November 6th as last Saturday's tie with Massachusetts remains the only game the Bobcats have failed to win during that time. They hit the ice again on Friday night when traveling partner Princeton comes to Hamden. While the men's team was on the road in New York, the Bobcats women's ice hockey team played host to the Rensselaer Engineers for the first time since February when Quinnipiac dominated its way to a 5-1 victory. How did Friday's game compare? Let's go to the bank and find out. Victoria Vigilante in net getting ready for RPI. Quinnipiac going to get on the board first. Kelly Babstock behind the net. Drops it off to Nicole Costa, who's going to skate around to the right post and put one through O'Brien's legs for the first goal. Nicole Costa leading the way. The Bobcats take the 1-0 lead. Trying to hold on to the lead a few minutes later. RPI peppering Victoria Vigilante. First a slap shot from the point. She stops that. Rebound kicks out. Another beautiful save. It kicks into the corner. And the Bobcats would clear it out. Looking to extend the lead further. That's Brittany Lyons taking a pass from Amanda Collin. Knocks it in with the backhand. Bobcats take the 2-0 lead. Unfortunately, RPI wouldn't go down without a fight. Catherine Schilter pack passes it on the backhand across the crease to Lauren Walsh, who beats Vigilante for the goal. RPI cuts the lead in half, 2-1 Bobcats in front. But leave it to Kelly Babstock to give the Bobcats some room. Uden Johansson to Babstock, one-timer shot and a goal. Bobcats have a safe 3-1 lead, and who else but Kelly Babstock looking to extend that. Gets the pass from Costa, flips in the goal. Bobcats take the win, 4-1. Here's Coach Rick Seeley after the game. I thought it was a great overall performance, and I thought it was maybe the most complete team effort since I've been in, here in terms of contribution from you know top line to bottom line, top all 60. The women's ice hockey team defeated ECAC foe RPI Friday night. Three different Bobcats scored in the 4-1 win, and goalie Victoria Vigilante turned away 15 of the 16 RPI shots. They return to ice tomorrow night, hosting ECAC rival Union. Reporting from the High Point Solutions Arena, I'm Taylor Massey. Sports Pause. Rick Seeley's Bobcat squad looked to stay hot, fresh off their 4-1 win over RPI. This time, the team welcomed the three-win Dutch woman of Union. A win would give the Bobcats their 10th of the season. Would they reach double digits? Oh, let's find out. I mentioned the Bobcats looking for that iconic win number 10. This team's been hot. Could they stay that way? Well, here come the Bobcats early on. Babstock's going to race towards the corner and off a pass, it's Nicole Brown. Her fourth goal of the season, the Bobcats are up one just two minutes into the game, but the Dutch woman would not be quiet. Rihanna Curio is going to find Alex Tankrell Fontaine, who's going to get it over to Christine Valenti. Valenti, the West Haven native, gets it to go inside the net. We are tied up off the power play. It's one to one, and later on in the first period, the Bobcats are on the power play of their own. Costa, she's gonna find Reagan Bolton. Bolton, the slap is coming off the roll. The puck finds Bolton. The shot, she's got it. The Bobcats lead two to one. That is Bolton's fourth goal of the season. Mark, there's something to do with these four goals. I don't know what it is. It was a specialty, I suppose, and the Bobcats. This is an awesome display of passing between Babstock, Costa, back to Babstock, and eventually Shelby Wignall is going to find a way to poke this one into the net. The Bobcats are up 3-1. to one. Babstock and Costa would both finish the game with, uh, with two assists, and that's the first goal of the season for Wignall, and then QU on the power play. Morgan Fritz Ward, she's going to find a way to get the puck into the net. That is her second goal of the season. The Bobcats secure their third straight win and improve to 6-3-1 in ACA, ACAC play. Well, just when you thought we talked enough about hockey, we're going to talk a little bit more about hockey. We're going to bring in our hockey expert, Taylor Massey, to give us her report card on the men's and women's ice hockey teams. Taylor, thank you for joining us. First grade the performance of the men's team the last three weeks. Well, Mark, I'm going to give the men's team an A based on the past three weeks. Now, if we were going to go before that time, this grade would be looking a little bit different. But right now, they're undefeated in their last eight games. They're number one in the ECAC, and 
They're, um, I mean, they're just doing so well. So really, what more can be said about this team? They have the best defense in the country as well. Um, so really, it started at the Colgate Cornell weekend. They beat the power play cor uh, curse, and um, they've really just been moved on, got their confidence back since then. They've been finding lines that are working for them, and they got the return of Connor Jones as well. So hopefully they can keep it going throughout the season. Now, Taylor, the team can't succeed without a good goaltender, so give us a grade for how Eric Hartzell's played this season. Well, I'm going to give Hartzell an A-. minus. Now, I'm going to give him the A- minus because he has a 93% save percentage this year. He's number third in the country for goals against average with 1.6 a game. But when you look at some of the stats for his games, you know, he faces 10 shots and he lets two of them go. So he's still showing a little bit of inconsistency. Now we're going to switch to the women's side. Not everything's all great over there, so grade their performance this weekend versus RPI and Union. For the women's weekend, I'm going to give them a B plus. Now they did have back-to-back 4-1 -back wins, but when you look at the teams, it was kind of expected. RPI and Union were winless in the ECAC going into ECAC. I'm sorry, going into the weekend. So really, we were looking for the wins this weekend. However, things to take from the women's ice hockey performance this weekend: they had a variety of players scoring, seven different Bobcats contributing this weekend. So all of the pressure wasn't on Babstock and Costa to get the goals this weekend. Also, Victoria Vigilante only took in um, two shots. So really, uh, she's been showing a little bit more consistency. So I'm going to give him a B plus for the weekend. And can we talk about the freshmen here for a second? How about you give us a grade with how they've performed? For the women's freshmen, I'm going to give them a B minus. This freshman class was very highly touted coming into the season, and I think I expected a little bit more of them. But there have been some standouts. Sydney Rusler has been has made a huge impact on the defense this year. She's been paired up with Captain Regan Bolton, and she's doing an, she's been doing an amazing job. Also, Nicole Connery and Nicole Brown have been handing in a handful of goals and assists, so they've really been working up. But I haven't seen quite as much as I wanted to see from these freshmen. So hopefully, we'll see a little bit more throughout the season and in the years to come once they get some years under their belt. Thanks again, Taylor. It's time for another break here on Sports Pause, but we've got more about the hockey and basketball teams when we return. We also have a feature about Mr. Billy Mecca himself, so if you like the sound of my voice or you just want to keep looking at John Alba's face, stay with us. We'll be right back. The Quinnipiac Athletic Department is offering special holiday ticket deals for select games this month. Adults will be able to enter the TD Bank Sports Center for just $1, while children and senior citizens will be admitted for free. The games featured include men's basketball on December 5th and the 29th, women's basketball on December 8th, and men's hockey on the 29th as well. A toy drive will also be held on December 7th when that same hockey team takes on Princeton at the High Point Solutions Arena. The Bobcats men's ice hockey squad entered this weekend's games versus Union and RPI as the 16th ranked team in the nation. The move to 16th was a two-spot jump from the previous poll released on November 19th. It should also be noted that the Bobcats moved into ninth place in the pairwise rankings after defeating Union on Friday. The pairwise rankings are a computer-based ranking system that judges teams based upon comparisons to one another. For more on the rankings or anything else college hockey related, visit uscho.com. Rick Seeley is looking forward to next season, even as his women's hockey squad is on a roll this year. Seeley announced on Thursday that the team secured seven commitments from the class of 2017. The national letters of intent include Canadian standout Taryn Bumgart, who was a member of Team Alberta in the 2010 Canada Games. The class also includes goaltender Sydney Rossman. Rossman was elite in the net for Minnetoka High School as she led them to consecutive state championships over the past two seasons. Head over to QuinnipiacBobcats.com for more information about the signings. Another segment, another expert. We now bring in Nick Dench to tell us which winter sports teams are contenders and which are just pretending to be. Nick, start with the women's basketball team. Contender or pretender? They're absolutely a contender this year, Mark. They have the, uh, almost the exact same starting lineup as they did last year, with the exception of Carrie Goodchild, but that opens up the starting spot for Jasmine Martin. This team has not lost anything. If anything, they've gotten better because they have experience from last year. I see no reason this team should not win the conference. Now, Nick, the men's team has taken a UConn to double overtime but lost two straight since. Are they a contender or are they a pretender? Within the NEC, I think they're a pretender. This is a very young team. They did lose James Johnson from last year. They need players to step up and start hitting layups, start making their free throws. Somebody's going to have to take James Johnson's spot from last year. It looks like it could be Zaid Hurst. But the teams that are in the NEC, such as Robert Morris and LIU Brooklyn, are just too experienced and too good from last year to 
not take that spot in the NEC again. All right, Nick, now let's hit the ice. The women's ice hockey team has won three games in a row, but lost three to nothing to Boston College on November 24th. Are they a contender? I think they can be a contender if they continue the consistent play of Victoria Vigilante and spreading the puck out. Every team in the country knows to look out for Kelly Babstock and Nicole Costa. They need more players to step up like they did this weekend in order for them to be a contender. And Nick, the question on everyone's mind is the men's ice hockey team for real or will this run end sometime soon? I see no reason this team won't continue their run that they're on right now. They have 11, 11 different players with multiple goals, 16 different players scoring goals. The only players that play consistently on this team that haven't scored are Danny Federico and Zach Tolkien. And so you love to see that out of a team. It's very hard to game plan. You have Jeremy Langlois, who's second among all active players in career goals. And then you have Eric Hartzell in net. And he's been so consistent for this team this year. And, and Nick, thank you so much as always. You know, Mark, as we wrap up the semester, we have to give it to our analysts because our analysts have been absolutely fantastic for us all season long. They do a great job every week, better than anyone at Quinnipiac or around the world. I'd like to think we have some of the best looking analysts as well. I mean, we even had the debate between two of them. You're not going to find that on any other sports program in the nation. So, hey, only on sports. Boss. Quinnipiac women's soccer coach Dave Clark was in the news this week for something other than soccer. Coach Clark's QU 101 class was featured on NBC Connecticut News on Wednesday, November 28th. The story highlighted the community involvement of Clark and his students. Several freshmen in the course recently worked to develop a fundraising project with all proceeds going to the victims of Hurricane Sandy. This is especially important to many of us here at Quinnipiac because hundreds of Quinnipiac students come from some of the hardest hit area locations excuse me, in the tri-state area. The project began at the TD Bank Sports Center at the Quinnipiac Men's Basketball Home Opener on November 12th. Several other groups collected clothing and additional donations around campus and the Hamden area. You know, John, it seems like all involved in the Quinnipiac sports scene know who Billy Mecca is. Is he that guy in athletics? Yep. Uh, doesn't he call basketball games, too? Yep. Uh, and he, uh, he does that dance, too, right? Yeah, that's him. All that and more, John. And our own Giovanni Mio had a chance to find out more behind the man that is Billy Mecca. An alum from Niagara University, senior associate athletic director Billy Mecca does it all. From in his office to doing broadcasts with Bill Schweitzer, one may wonder how he got here in the first place. But I don't think I ever really thought about the next step. And I was fortunate enough that uh, my college coach, uh, Danny Raskin, had been an assistant at Quinnipiac many, many, many years ago. And there was an opening here, and I said, why not be a coach? I mean, it's what I do, it's what I like, and that's how I ended up here. But why did exactly Billy Mecca stop coaching? I gave up coaching because I got tired of dealing with 13 knucklehead basketball players, and now I can deal with 450 athletes. And while it's important for them to play well and their coaches for them to play well, I really don't care. I care about their progress as an individual, uh, how they're doing in the classroom, how they're doing socially. Uh, so a resource for the kids, I think, is something that I'm fortunate to do. I do the radio and uh, TV for basketball, which I totally enjoy. So uh, I like to say I have the best job in the country. One day, a magazine ad from a train gave Billy the biggest wake-up call of his life. It caught my eye, and the woman found out that she had lymphoma by touching her neck. Um, I touched my neck, and for the first time ever, um, I had a pit in my stomach. I knew I had cancer. I had a lump on my neck. Right when Billy recovered from lymphoma, Mecca had another setback. I fell asleep. My wife thought I was sick. Woke up three hours later. While not in pain anymore, I was pretty washed out. And went to my doctor's. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in the middle of a 24-hour heart attack. Mecca mentioned how suffering from cancer makes you think of death. You start thinking about, you could have died. Now what? And where are you going to go when you die? Thanks to Christianity, and Quinnipiac University, Billy Mecca was able to recover even better. Quinnipiac's my second home, uh, and it's a place that uh, I raised my family around, you know. Uh, my wife moves up from Maryland when she's 20 years old. We get married when she's 21, I'm 22. And our life started here at Quinnipiac, and our life will end here at Quinnipiac professionally. Mecca is known for a dance he does called the Cupid Shuffle. He started this during QU's 2010 Men's Basketball Conference Championship run. He says it's to show how he can always be himself 
at certain times. There was some excitement in that facility, and I wanted people to understand that, you know what, it's cool to care, and I really do care. So that became my thing. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to it. So I asked Billy if he could teach me how to do the Cupid Shuffle, and he gave me a good response. All right, the big thing is when you do it, the word that we're going to talk about is swag. So swag. S-W-A-G. You got that phone? You got to have swag. You need swag. To do it. Okay, the key is as the music goes, we're going to take three steps to the right. Yeah. All right, and it's going to be like real cool like. Oh, yeah. To the left now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're going to kick. Kick, kick, now kick. Now we're going to turn it out. And, you know, Mark, next semester we'll catch Gio at Toads and see how he did with those dance moves with the ladies. But uh, we'll have to see. He looked a little rusty there. You know, some people will do anything to get on camera, huh? I don't, I, I don't blame them sometimes. But, you know, Mark, I mentioned in the beginning of the show, we have a new era upon us at Sports Pause. And the previous era lasted over the last 11 months. And it was with our executive producers, Mike Orletta, and Kyle Gravitt, and these two have done a lot for the show, and the, the foundation that they have built is, can only be told in form of a video package. So here it is. Michael Aletta and Kyle Gravitt took over as executive producers for Sports Balls nearly one year ago. Today, the show has become one of the premier shows on Q30 television. You know, I think that most importantly for us, it was always to kind of climb the ladder, not necessarily shoot for the stars. It was all content based because it's difficult in college to get commitment from a lot of people. But if you have a strong base, you're able to create better content. And so we're all about the content. Their hard work and dedication to the show paid off in the form of national recognition and helped solidify their working relationship. I would say I'm most proud um, of, of going out to Chicago with him. Um, and sitting in the in the award room and us being one of the top three finalists for best sports cast in the nation. When I took over with Kyle, you know, he was able to keep me down to earth and, you know, kind of show me this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. But it's a relationship that I've really benefited from. Even with all of the success, Mike knows that the sky is the limit and patience will be the key for the show's future. We are continuously grow growing, but the thing that surprised me the most is that we're doing it at such a rapid pace. Everybody wants to be on camera, but you have to understand that you need to work your way up, and the only way you're going to get better is with patience. Sports Balls would like to thank Mike and Kyle for all they put into the show. Because of them, the future for the program is promising. And Mark, I talked about the new era and, you know, the two people taking over are none other than yourself and the oh-so-funky Giovanni Mio. So congratulations to you two, and I can tell you that all of us here on the Sports Pulse staff are very excited for what's ahead. Thank you, John. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to take this show even farther than it already has come. Great things are ahead, but as one era ends, a new one begins. And who doesn't love a new beginning, John? For more information on our show or the station in general, log on to www.q30.org. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Q30 Sports. We hope everyone watching has a great winter break and a happy and healthy holiday season. For our producers, analysts, and everyone behind the scene who has helped make this show a success for the last 11 months, we thank you for joining us. I'm John Alba. He's Mark Spillane. And John, I think this party is over. Good night, everyone. <laughs>